This is a topic, testing is a topic that this particular class covers in greater depth than any other uh, class within the CS curriculum. And uh, where we're going to be going proceeds in, in um, phases. Uh, uh, less, we, we've talked already about testability, we've talked about defect tracking and, and defect reports, we've talked about the life cycle of bugs. Um, today we're going to be talking about some additional sort of grab bag of topics. Um, the role of alpha beta testing, some aspects having to do with um, a series of, of strong recommendations that I'd love to see put into place for your teams. Um, uh, we're, we're also going to be going in uh, in coming lectures into particulars of test case design, how you build your test cases, and the nature of those test cases, the different levels of testing, and particular tools, um, conceptual tools, to allow you to build test cases that will thoroughly exercise the program from different perspectives, logically, in terms of the branching and sort of where the program reaches, in terms of user input, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, we'll be introducing a set of concepts along the way. Um, so this is kind of a waypoint which, which introduces uh, a grab bag of materials, but um, a certain, um, a lot of suggestions, okay? Um, this first one is, is something I've emphasized before. It's the good principle of life. Um, uh, when, when something screws up, don't just fix the situation. Ask how you got there and how you can make yourself less likely to end up there again and how you could have found it sooner. Um, and I'll come back to that at the end of today's lectures a little bit. Um, I, I was heartened uh, during the presentations to hear about a commitment to test-driven development. And I think you folks were exposed to it in 370, right? Yeah. So make the tests, make them run successfully. Initially, the system should fail the test. Why is that? Maybe it's so obvious it doesn't need saying, but why is it the system will, if you write the test first, and then you're going to only then begin to talk, well, why did the test fail at first? Yeah. You haven't actually written the code. You haven't written the code that has any of the logic yet. You know what I mean? James. James, thank you. Um, doesn't have the logic in place, so of course it's going to fail the test. It, it can't accomplish what the tests are evaluating, right? Um, the sort of criteria for success. And so then you make the system run properly, but then there's this further step of make it run. What's meant by that? Then by make it run and then make it run. Make it run means the test runs successfully. So it passes the test. What does make it run? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are errors. There are, there are, so by and large, you're going to make it run with the, the test in a way that's pretty good, but there's going to be errors that you find, and there's going to be problems that you identify. And make it right involves fixing all. Fixing the oversights, fixing. Generally, it's probably going to work pretty well for certain common cases, but often it, it has problems. So making it run, the tests may run. I, I, I shouldn't have said that they always pass. They don't. But at least it runs and, and you know, runs the tests. And, uh, and some of them will fail, and some will succeed. And hopefully, a fair number of them succeed. But then making it right, you make sure that all of them succeed, right? There's often another pass here of making it right, which involves refactoring. And again, what is refactoring? What defines refactoring? Um, changing code without changing the function. Yeah, beautiful point. You change the code without changing the functionality. You're not actually changing what it does, but how it does it, right? Um, and in that, uh, that may mean improving what? So if you don't change the functionality, what what might you improve with the code? Give me a couple of things. Yeah. Brett Mason. Mason. Yeah. <laughs> started my algorithm started and I, I detected it. Um, I'm debugging my process here. I, I detected it sooner. Okay. Um, good. Um, so uh, Great, 
Others? Others? Yeah. Readability? Yeah, readability of code. Others? Well. Could change like what libraries or what sort of algorithms you're depending on? Yeah, yeah. So maybe you, you uh, uh, could make use of more efficient algorithms. You could make use of libraries that uh, might be available with less with fewer licensing fees or, or available um, uh, more, you know, more broadly accessible or more widely known. So, uh, so all those are good. You might enhance the scalability aspects of the performance, you know, make it more lightweight in terms of memory, um, uh, make it better documented uh, in terms of self-documented code, implement it in a more elegant way. You might you might divide up the code in a modular fashion so that pieces of it can be reused for other tasks rather than being one hairball. Uh, there's lots of things you can do to, to make it, you know, pretty, um, to make it, it right and, and make it uh, uh, make it more effective as a as a, as a code base. Um, you folks are using a bug tracking system. I don't need to invade the importance of that. We talked about it last time. Building testability from the start, we talked about it. I really would like to see, you know, assertions, some form of test hooks, tracing and logging for your projects. Um, this is an important lesson. Automate most tests. That's a challenging one to invade when you're talking about, about um, for example, uh, using Oculus. Um, I, I understand some of the challenges, many of the challenges. But for traditional development, this is really an important thing. Why would we automate most tests? Why go through the trouble? Well, when I say, well, you tell me, what automated tests, what are their pros and what are their cons? What are some <coughs> pros? What are some attractive things about automated tests? Yeah, okay, so saves time. Give me give me a concrete example of what you mean by that. Um, if you're testing DDY maybe, you don't actually have to have the person manually clicking the button every yeah. time you want to test it. Yeah. Yeah, so so it's it's whip quick, or at least pretty darn quick to re rerun the test after some modifications like a bug fix. You know, someone fixes a bug and the risk there is what? Another bug. They've introduced, they've just shifted the bugs or added, added more without realizing it. And if you can run automated tests, it saves human time. You might be able to do it just a lot faster clock time, right? So it's sort of human time and clock time. Saves you work, but it can also save you, like, we can redo these tests in a way that would be impossible. Like in 10 minutes, we redo tests that would take manually a couple hours, and therefore we can get this this bug verified um, within the, the deadline um, and roll back if it's, if it's not suitable. Okay, so what's another advantage of, uh, of automated tests? Yeah, Matthew. It's just overall good for repetitively checking static functionality of uh, code based overall period of time. Yeah, so, so sort of, um, uh, I don't know if I'll, maybe I'll say dependability or sort of consistency and just checking this um, uh, checking this on a, a very regular basis in a way that would be incredibly tedious, right? For for someone to just keep on going through this every time, and and it does so over um, consistency and sustainable. It, like you could run it for. Over many months, you might run it hundreds of times, and it's fine, right? <laughs> the tester is not going to quit. Uh, others, I saw another hand up. What's another pro of automated tests? Matthew, again, the use of continuous integration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could tie in with with CI tie-in. So um, you know, immediate run uh, upon check-in, right? Um, and you can tie in, by extension, with uh, smoke test or, um, or the build success, right? With the advantage being, uh, if it fails this, 
you could say, wait a minute, we want to roll back this, uh, this check-in because it's not ready for prime time. It's breaking things, right? Um, so I like that. Um, other, other things about automated, uh, automated tests? I think that's a pretty good set. What are the downsides of automated tests? Like the paper this side of the room, Joe. How are you doing, folks? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, with automated tests, if you're not modifying them over time, uh, you end up running the same tests. And this, if, even if you think that they're good, they're not going to cover as much as uh, as manually going through it and trying to break it for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're rigid. And actually, there's a lot of there's a lot of insights that come from exploratory testing and being able to, you know, try innovative things. You, you notice this is really slow, or that was weird. Um, uh, you thought you saw something, or, or it, you know, it didn't respond the first time you did it, and it did the other, and you thought, okay, it's weird. It has that long delay, or, or it, it, that it's inconsistent in this regard. It gives you clues to how you can you might probe it more flexibly. So it's rigid versus uh, flexible, the flexibility of manual uh, testing. Okay, other things? Yeah, Will. Well, building on that, like, as you sort of modify and change your code base, some of them are eventually going to become outdated, and you might have to sort of understand why right away. Darn right, that's right. These accumulate in ways that um, lead them to uh, to sometimes not be clear what their purpose is or if their relevance. Um, so, so they can, um, uh, they can, I'll say become outdated. Um, one part of it is outdated. And the problem with, with there's one side of outdated that is it requires updates, right? This is a key thing. Code base evolves, often the tests have to evolve with. The automated tests, right? So um, they require evolution, right? Um, you got to evolve them with the code base. Um, another thing is they lose a purpose. So sometimes, um, you know, a, per, uh, a feature has been deprecated or or has been merged in, and there's kind of a, an orphan test that doesn't really serve much function anymore. Maybe you're testing that an invariant holds that no longer um, uh, no longer is relied upon by your code, and as a result, it you know it doesn't need to be 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 tested anymore because uh, it's it's not something the code uh, heavily heavily relies on. Um, so these are true. What's what's another con? It, it maybe almost goes without saying. Yeah. It's more of a time cost. Yes. Um, so more excellent. That's exactly the one I was, I was thinking about. Um, more upfront cost to run. Right. Um, it takes time to write these. Yeah. Big, big time. Um, and uh, and so they they take about ten times as long sometimes as, as manually performing the test. It's been on, it's been estimated. It takes about ten times the effort to produce uh, an automated test as to just perform it um, manually. Now that's a broad brush statement because it's going to be very different for for different tests that are require very long manual times, but. It can be many times the effort to, to write them. And then you've got to rewrite them in the event of evolution. Um, but nonetheless, automating tests, if, if, you have a, if you have a test that failed in the past, it's a prime candidate for automating going forward. Because it's, what's, it's indicative of what might be called a regression if it fails again. In other words, you can detect if this bug will be We'll talk about that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, check test errors. If you write automated tests, make sure they get tested. And this is actually a shortcoming of automated tests 
if they're not implemented naively, is sometimes we don't even check that they run successfully. It requires extra effort. Whereas if you're doing it manually, it's more or less obvious in the short term if it fails and you can act on it. So be sure to have tests log their results or otherwise record it in a way you can find. Um, consider risk, we'll come back to that. Um, bug reports, I said to, to consider them, um, to make sure you, you uh, put them in place, these defect reports, in a, in a balanced way. Okay, I want you to consider for your projects, particularly four types of things. This is something for you to really consider. These are assets. The third of them, I always get rave results about, rave, rave uh, ratings on, on these from the teams after they perform, which is bug parties. Um, but pair testing, this is kind of like pair programming, but two people are testing together. Two sets of eyes, two heads thinking about it, and often you can find uh, defects that you might not have come up with one, you know, each on their own. Buddy testing is, I test, I unit test your code, you unit test my code, we're two devs. We're responsible for unit testing, most unit testing. Testers may still write some unit tests, but by and large, it's a developer responsibility to write unit tests. Amongst other things, before they write the code. So, Buddy testing is, is uh, like writing your, your, your test initially, but, but you have me write it for that person's code and vice versa. And it helps reduce the chance that the same person who wrote, wrote the, the, the code will write tests in a way that is the same misunderstanding in both, right? Because when I write the code, I might have a misunderstanding about what it's supposed to do. And if I'm the one writing the test for it, maybe I have the same misunderstanding in my text. Whereas another person may be more clued in to what was really meant by, by this. Bug parties um, are very effective at several levels. One is finding defects, another is allowing us to estimate how many undiagnosed defects are out there. And basically it's, um, it's pretty straightforward. You get a bunch of your team together uh, to bang on your software. Bang on your software and try to find defects. That's a lot of fun. Doing it together is often more effective because you can share impressions about what's solid, what's not solid, what's problematic about it, and it can give you ideas for more effective testing on your part. Now, bug parties to estimate undiagnosed defects. I'm not going to spoil that lecture, but fundamentally you divide your team into half. So you don't have half the group doing the bug party at the same time the other half was doing it in a different place, not sharing information. And you look at the overlap between the defects they find. If there's a large amount of overlap, it's probably a sign that they're finding a lot of the bugs out there. If there's uh, not a lot of overlap, it's probably a sign that there's a lot more bugs out there than either found. Okay. Um, and then finally, hallway usability test. The idea here is, Try to get other people using it outside your team. Just whoever you can get. Family members, friends, um, person you sit next to on the bus, whatever. Try, try it out and give their impression on it. Okay, it's, it's sort of usability from someone outside the team. Because the problem is, we as software engineers, often we know how our software works. We know what it's supposed to do and so it's hard for us to test it quite as effectively and give a usability assessment as someone from outside. We know what's supposed to happen. Um, okay, builds. Required code is tested by the dev against the smoke test before you check it in. And look, if your smoke test consists of running a swack of, swack of particular tests, you know, um, system tests and maybe some unit tests, um, if, if that's, if that's kind of what you're putting in place for a smoke test, I, I won't protest too much. Um, but make sure those are run before the check-in occurs, before you commit your, your, your changes. Um, it makes it less likely the build will have, to, uh, will have been a, a problem and you'll have to roll back. Um, 
and uh, do unit tests during the build as well on, on unit tests. Okay? Um, when there are requirement changes within your team, communicate them across the team. Why, why is this so important? Why, why, why is it incumbent often on the project manager to make sure that team members all hear about the recent changes to requirements? Yeah, Will. Totally, totally. Elements of the design, um, the test matrices, the um, the the path-based testing plans through the system as different units. All these things have to change. And if there's a few people on the team who don't know about the latest changes, they may be going and doing, you know, who knows what with the old plans in ways that are no longer relevant. And they'll get smacked, smacked later. They'll find bugs that aren't bugs because they, they're, you know, they're, they would have been considered bugs in the old requirements, but now they're correct operation. The, and they'll generally waste their time, and or waste other people's time. Was there another hand up? Um, I have my yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so make sure that the uh, that the testers tech uh, interface closely with the developers. In this three seventy one context, there's often a some teams have testers and devs paired up, and that's not a bad solution. Like this tester works with this developer a lot to test this area of features for which that developer is responsible. At least there you have a close working relationship. And that can be pretty good. That can be very effective. By contrast, um, there are teams which are a lot less effective where the testers are kind of working totally separate from developers and the testers don't know what's really going on and they don't know what's been implemented and the, te and the developers are rolling things out at the last minute and it, the testing is a lot less effective. You know, testers feel like they haven't gotten a chance to really test this system because till the last minute, the devs were working, right? And, and didn't release things in time for them to realistically test. That's one of the, the um, the problems that can occur. So I talked about buddy testing. I don't think I'll go through it, but if anyone likes to see things, and then bug parties. Um, they are a good morale boost. It's just a lot of fun, too. It's just a lot of fun to try to drive down and find out. So you can have a leaderboard, and, and you know you may want to reward people um, uh, for, for those who, who find the most. You can order a pizza and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, have a dessert for the person who wins the, the most or something. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun, it's very effective, and it's a lot more effective than if each person were doing it in isolation. Among other things, people learn how the system works and how it's supposed to work, right? Like someone says, wait, this is broken, and someone says, no, 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 you, you just forgot to fill in this field. Um, and they learn better, you know, it spreads knowledge about how the system, the different areas of the system work, okay? Um, and by the way, um, if you find bugs, you can create test cases, right? Automatic test cases that, from the standpoint of regression, make sure that doesn't uh, reoccur. And th this was uh, how I used ability testing. Okay. Um, okay. A couple more suggestions, or a number of more suggestions. One thing is beware of skipping tests late check-ins. I mean. When check-ins occur late in the game, like shortly before a release, try to avoid that. Try to freeze your code. This is widespread practice in industry. You'll undergo what's called a code freeze. Can anyone tell me what's a code freeze? Yeah, please. So you just put a hard cap on actual development and focus entirely on, on fixing yeah. um, whatever you've done in the or whatever else is. So pretty good, pretty good basic definition there. But I want to... I want to sharpen that. Is it the fact that devs can't touch the code base after the code freeze? No. They can't put in place new features after the code freeze. They can fix bugs after the code freeze. And uh, they may, um, they may you know, multiply, add comments, better explicate things, maybe add some test hooks, that sort of stuff. That's OK, but no new features. If there are no new features after that, 
the tester is going to have a double of a time testing their system if, if the devs are working until hours before the deliverable. And what this means is that the testers are not going to be very effective. Um, and often they'll, it'll hurt their morale and, and it'll hurt the, the quality of the whole project because you're not going to have code that's contributed late in the game adequately tested. Um, so look, if you have late check-ins um, uh, for bug fixes or whatever, make sure you run tests on them. Just because it's very close to the deadline doesn't mean it should be exempted from tests. In fact, it means the tests are probably more important than ever because they were rushed often, right? Sometimes they're the most buggy. Okay, so you plan for non-functional tests here. You folks should be thinking about tests that maybe aren't first and foremost on your mind. Um, stress testing. What is what is stress testing compared to load testing? Anyone? We talk about stress testing the system. What are we often thinking about? <coughs> you learn as a practicing software engineer. It's, there's often a really big difference between creating code that basically works and it delivers the functionality, creating high performance code that works at, at, at very effective levels of performance and which will work well even when it's really stressed. Um, now this sounds odd, but often the times where your system's under stress are the times where it's most needs, it, it is most needed that it operate correctly. So think about a website. Think about websites. What, what sort of circumstances, if you develop a web app, maybe it's to sell tickets, or maybe it's um, for customers of your small business, um, or pros prospective customers to learn about your systems. You know, includes some demos, includes uh, a, set of, a set of resources, um, et cetera. What would be a, a sort of a stressful condition for that website? Yeah, these Peak hours. Yeah, peak hours. And, and particularly, net traffic is very bursty a lot of the time. It like comes in orders of magnitude more people can access it sometimes than others. And often, it's like if you're at a trade show and you announce your product, that's when you want your system to be at, at its performing at its best. Tons of people might be looking at it, right? In the next 15 minutes, because you've tweeted out, you know, the uh, the link to your to your latest product release, um, you have tons of people coming there to take a look or to download it or to evaluate or to see a demo or whatever. And um, you want your system to really shine at those cases because all their eyes are on it. They want to see it. They're interested in it. They're qualified customers who know something about this product and, and are, are interested in, in potentially getting it. And if it doesn't perform at those times, these bursty times where tons of people are coming, you've missed major business offers. That's like the time where you want it to be at its best. And those times are often where it's really hit. And so it's often easy to build systems comparatively that basically operate okay under common conditions. It's harder, considerably harder, to make them that operate well under stress. What happens under stress when a system's under stress? Okay, so it's being banged on by tens of thousands of people. It's a, maybe it's a web app. Uh, not responding. Won't well, respond. And what happens when you get non-response? Or maybe it's, it's got tons of calls to the database. 
things are thrashing on disk, what happens? At, at a technical level, what, what sort of errors tend to happen if you have things non-responding for a while? You get, yeah, Lisa. They'll start running into timeouts. Timeouts, yeah. So your network connection, your, your database connection runs out when you've got a query data. Or your, the browsers of the people hitting it get a timeout. Um, you've, got, you've got a server 500 error that, that comes up because it, it can't uh, access the requisite information from the database or over the internal network. In short, your system starts to creak and, and uh, at some point may encounter errors. Um, if, it's, if it's not stress tested properly. And that can lead to embarrassing, you know, egg on your face sort of situations with respect to potential customers. Stress testing is testing the system with low memory, low disk space, for example, uh, congested network. Load testing is specifically testing it with lots and lots of users at the same time. Your database is slow. You might have two different transactions. You also have a transaction, database transaction. Yeah, from 355. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you got multiple transactions going on, and what happens um, if one transaction is operating on some data? that the other wants to write or wants to read from while the other is operating on it. What, get, what gets taken out? A lock. It's called a lock, okay. The, the database software takes out locks. And if the system is going really slow, some of those locks may be taken out for seconds, many seconds. And once again, things can time out, transaction, transactions fail, you know, it needs this information to complete the financial transaction, it doesn't complete in 15 seconds, it cancels it, and, and it, um, it ends up, you know, causing a problem. So you really want to test it with large amounts of concurrency, many, many users. Um, uh, you want to look at scaling, um, so with users, but also amount of data or amount of, uh, amount of uh, needs or operations requested. The memory footprint of it. Why do I say memory footprint? Who cares about memory? Why? Yeah. Um, Basically. Can you take an example of what server, uh, if you have tens of thousands of people, and everyone requests, uh, if it's just a couple more megabytes than it should be, and RAM it starts to add up really quickly? Totally. Hosting costs me. That's right. So memory often is the resource that gets, is one of the resources that get exhausted the earliest. And at that point, if memory gets exhausted, what, what happens at a concrete level? What happens in the operating system? It starts, yeah, amazing. Paging. Yeah, it starts paging. It starts taking stuff out of memory, putting it to disk, bring it back in for other segments that are being loaded. And that costs like by a factor of a thousand or something in terms of 10,000, the amount of the speed of things. And that can lead to cascading failures and timeouts, et cetera. So test your systems at scale. Try to test them as you increase the, uh, the numbers. Look, at some point, particularly for 371 projects, you're going to max out your ability to handle it. But if you can articulate for me when that is and say, look, our system is only good up to you know, 20 users, or our system is good up to five, or our system is good up to this size of data sets, I will be a happy camper because you've done your homework and you've been able to indicate proactively you know, the, the sphere in which this can be used uh, uh, reliably and where, it, where its limits are. That is a good thing. That is a good thing. And what you'll find is you can put in a lot of tuning. If you had longer time, you can put in a lot of tuning and, and really push those limits uh, effectively. Um, so what makes systems like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud, on, uh, Azure on the Microsoft platform really shine is not just the, perform the, um, the basic functionality, but how they perform under stress or under load load and how they scale effectively, how they handle concurrency. 
And this requires a lot of attention and optimization and really, really getting to the heart of the performance bottlenecks. Um, okay, I said isolate and test as environment before. Perform exploratory tests. What was said earlier, and I liked it, and I can't remember who it was, but um, uh, I think it was Mesa who said, look, fundamentally, automated tests are right, rigid. It's just a fixed script, it runs through it, and that's all. Exploratory testing, you can often pick up on things. Usability issues, user experience issues, issues having to do with sort of flakiness of certain aspects, slowness in certain operations that shouldn't be slow, um, you know, inconsistency in how certain things are printed across different, uh, across different, um, uh, different pages of the app that you might not have noticed in that a, an automated test won't, won't actually pick up that it's inconsistent here and here if it's testing each in isolation, for example. Um, regression tests should be automated. Um, we'll come back to this issue. Um, make sure devs don't circulate uh, defects amongst each other just on an ongoing basis. I assign it to you, you assign it to so-and-so, they assign it to me. Um, Try to find testing tools that work for your platforms. Um, investigate them early and, and evaluate how they work in prototypes. Um, and then, as I said, code freeze prior to deliverable. Um, don't assume obvious bugs have been reported previously. Things get missed. Make sure it, it, it does get reported or check if there's an existing report on that um, before you just discard it. Um, and quickly report defects. We're going to be talking about, about corner cases and, and boundary cases, but often bugs live at boundaries. They live at something that's you know, right at the edge of it, it's, it's this sort of case or that sort of case. Um, because that's where logical mistakes are often made on the part of developers, and off by one error, et cetera. We'll come back to that. Um, uh, okay, look, if you have an error that's not reproducible, report it. I, I know you only saw it once, you can't reproduce, but, and try, but if you can't, report it. Maybe others are encountering it, and maybe between the different reports, you'll start to see some pattern behind what, um, um, what, what creates it. Um, Try to bug fixes, try to quickly check them, try to turn them around quickly. Um, using interfaces, if you're working in a language with static typing, I recognize one group. Its latest plan is not. With JavaScript, I feel bad for you folks working with JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel your pain. I had a student who was working, he did an, audit, he did an awesome Oculus data visualization form system, uh, system for us um, a couple years back. And he was struggling with a bug that lasted, I think, maybe the better part of a week. And it turned out to be some dumb thing where, you know, it interpreted this as a string and it converted it to a number automatically and then it used that as the number and it obscured the underlying defect. I mean, it's, I, I feel your pain. Um, there are other systems like TypeScript to, you know, to help with that. Those working with, with static, statically typed languages, like um, the Oculus team, um, you know, you have C-sharp interfaces, and interfaces provide a way of automating tests against them, where the interface may remain the same even though the underlying implementation changes. And if you, if you have tests depend on interfaces, those tests don't need to be recompiled every time you change the detail of some part of the implementation. Um, uh, rotate testers through different features. Uh, try to get testers working on different sets of the same project. This is important. And just remember, testing the same issue is not duplicated effort. Um, so you should find things. And finally, testers and the end users should, should close, the, uh, close the bug reports at the end, not the, uh, not the devs. I will note that many testing teams find it really useful. This is from Rex Black, uh, Critical Testing Process. It's a, a thoughtful book on this. But many testing teams first do some confirmation testing. They run a set of automated tests and some manual tests that are pre-planned. And then they'll use exploratory testing.
to sort of bang at the system and see what they can shake out of it defect wise and meanwhile you know bug fixes are being put over but but releases are only being made periodically for the test team to be able to make some progress in terms of testing a particular product I'm not going to go through these in detail but there's lots of test tools out there for for many systems um, right um, try to when you're testing testing not all testing is equal you're not just looking for any old bug you're often focusing on parts of the system that are risky. Um, why might parts of a system be risky? Give me a couple of reasons that you might think that a given area of the system merits a special focus in testing. Give me some reasons. Why, why might this area of the system be judged more risky than another? Reason. Yeah, complicated out, tr tricky logic. Good, good. Others? Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, Evan and then James. Potential race conditions? Yes, yeah. So, there's race conditions, conditions which, which make it, you know, make for possible risks of uh, concurrency, particularly leading to, uh, to problems or non deterministic results where one way works fine, maybe most of the time it works fine, the other way it, it, it crashes. Yeah, James. Uh, maybe it's beautifully like sensitive information. Yeah, yeah. So it's predicted it'd be devastating if there's security security problems with it, um, or if that information is revealed by accident, you know, as a result of a query. Right. Um, you want to make sure that you can't use um, some script kitty can't get you know SQL injection in there and just get out lots of the uh, internal information. Good. Others. Other reasons you might focus on certain areas of high risk. Yeah, Evan. Just dealing with that. Uh, any, any place that deals with user input. Yeah, that's right. Because um, users can be malicious, and and they could take it upon themselves to try to break your system. And I can tell you, there will be users you encounter, even in this class, who will try to break your system. <laughs> Not just one user. Um, but several, um, and uh, we are legion. Um, and <laughs> we will, we will, we will. If we don't crush your system, we'll at least uh, we'll at least put it through its serious paces. Um, uh, okay, so a cause of risk: complexity of code, new design, late changes in there, feature importance. You know, um, rush coding is there. You know. Um, uh, so, so there's, there's problems that can affect code quality associated with known libraries that may, may have uh, had problems in the past, past bugginess for this area. Uh, areas that are hard to test in its, its details or low levels of unit testing. I mean, look, we, if you have trouble in the Unity project, you know, testing certain types of things, put more effort into them manually, right? If, if you can't test them automated, at least show that you've made efforts to um, take that into account in planning your manual testing and ramp up your manual testing for those areas. Other areas might be fairly easy to test um, in, a, in an automated way. Okay, I want to spend uh, my closing comments in two areas. One is regression. So I want to define this, and this is highly examinable. It's, it's, I think it's rare to have an exam in this course without asking a question related to this. Okay. The papers come out and um, attention is fixed. Actually, you folks are, I appreciate your, your uh, attention. So regression, a regression is considered to have occurred if a, if a change to the system matches one of two criteria. Either it breaks the feature that previously worked, or it re-exposes a previous bug. Okay? Um, sort of it. This bug was fixed, or was thought to be fixed for a while, and this brings it out again. Okay? Um, so there was a bug that used to be there, maybe it was fixed for a certain number of, of revisions to the system, and now it comes out again in this latest version. 
or it breaks a feature that previously worked. Okay? And the basic deal with regression tests is there's a lot of tests we'll often perform for regression tests just to make sure the system is still working. And sometimes these are too numerous. For certain corporate contexts, it can be too numerous than what you can test and build. And so often you'll have a set of regression tests that you will run en masse separately from the build um, uh, periodically, maybe nightly or something like that. Okay? Because if you have a regression test gap, the gap between the test set and the entire test set that's ever been run, there's room for things that used to, you know, used to be verified as working, no longer working. Um, and regressions have a particular particular importance because of a couple things. One thing is what I talked about before, that for a lot of bugs, we fix them, and it introduces, the attempted fix introduces new bugs. And you may think, coders, that this is unlikely, but the statistics on it are not encouraging. So if there's modifications of less than 10 statements, it's estimated 50, and actually, this is a worse number than I, I remember before. 50% of bug fixes work for modifications less than 10 statements. For modifications to around 50 statements, 20% of bug fixes work. These are sobering statistics because it means most of the time you attempt a non-trivial fix, you know, or a fix that's larger, it's like 50 statements, which is not earth shattering in its complexity, but it's quite a bit. 80% of the time, you're introducing a new defect in the act of fixing another or, or modifying another, um, another section of code, such as to fix a defect. And even localized modifications, as often as not, seem to introduce bug fixes. Um, and there's many reasons for this. Um, you know, you wrote too specialized a fix. You didn't understand the bug report. Um, uh, you know, you, you misrecalled that you thought you fixed it. There's a failure of, of reasoning, okay? Um, so, in short, fixing bugs often introduces new bugs. And often it will introduce the same bug as was there previously or very similar one. So, regression tests, I mentioned regression tests, a regression occurs under two circumstances. One, a feature that worked before no longer worked. Okay. Um, and, and the second one is that it didn't re-expose or leave unfixed the targeted bug. Okay. Um, so one of the issues here um, is that if we go and put into place a putative fix that breaks earlier features, um, uh, there's it, the problem is much worse than if if we simply break new features or, or a new feature doesn't work properly. So if you think about it, existing features for your system are being counted on by users. New features are sought by users potentially. They'd like to use them, but they're kind of a, if I could put it, in many cases they're nice to have. Existing features, if you break them, you are delivering negative value. You're not just not delivering added value, for a new feature, you are fundamentally delivering negative value because you're depriving people of the ability to work with you know, features that they have been working with. You're basically depriving, for example, their documents of certain functionality that it has had. And this is potentially disastrous to company morale, loyalty, et cetera. Um, moreover, um, you know, with existing systems, uh, with existing features, you're disrupting workflow. There's often a high cost of, of, of repair um, if it's already with a customer and you can lose image. You know, it's very embarrassing. New features, sometimes users say, maybe I just don't understand it. They just don't use it. It's not as big a deal. Um, and uh, one of the other challenges, existing features are often, it's high cost to detect that you've broken um, because you have to run a whole bunch of regression tests. Make sure these features that were working before are still working. Um, 
It's not impossible. You're expected to do it, but um, but it takes uh, it takes effort. And often, you're if you break an existing feature, you're <coughs> not repairing unfamiliar code because it's not a new feature. A new feature often you're familiar with. You're f at least feel familiar with the code base for that, and therefore it can often be uh, put into place uh, more easily. Okay. Um, so. Uh, one thing I will say, though, is that in terms of reemergence of earlier bugs, why, why might, so we, we said again, one form of regression is old features no longer work. Old features that did work no longer work. That's disastrous in my opinion. It's very detrimental to customer value. Another thing, again, is, is earlier bugs reemerge or were never fixed. Why would that be? Why do earlier bugs reemerge? Give me a reason associated with continuous integration and, and how developers modify code, deal with ch others' changes. Why might an earlier bug be emerge? Yeah, well. The original fix wasn't an actual fix. Yeah, yeah. So, so you make the same mistake again. And you say you fixed it, but you didn't, right? And maybe it was based on misunderstanding. Of, of what the problem was. You know, the, the dev who worked on it thought it was a much simpler issue and it turns out it was, you know, they didn't understand the extent of it or what was really meant. This occurs a huge amount. You wouldn't believe how often this occurs. And you think from the description it should be obvious, but it turns out there's misunderstanding there. So they think it's fixed, but really that wasn't the issue that was being reported, the one that they fixed. That was just one aspect of that, and it's still a problem. So this occurs a lot. But what's another reason that, let's suppose there was a defect that was fixed before. Why might it reemerge? Yeah? Well, same thing. People are working on the code, and if one person is uh, working and they fixed the bug and pushed it, yeah. and then someone else has older code that still has the bug, totally. and they pushed it over top. Totally. So you have a merge conflict, and it's, Someone slaps down the old code and top the new code. Does this ever happen? Yes, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. And it doesn't happen deliberately, you know, except in very rare cases, but it, 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 it can happen when you're dealing with merge conflicts that you put in what you think is innocuous change. There's nothing significant in this, and, and so you're just taking your copy of it rather than theirs for that part of the code, and you miss something important. But it also, look, things involve tricky parts of the design. You know, it's, it, you make the same mistakes reasoning as before, the same misunderstanding. Um, uh, there's not information about what's really uh, at issue to fix it well that that's, um, that's, you know, goes between developers. Um, uh, or you, you recycle earlier, earlier attempts at it. So, you know, um, for all these reasons, bugs that were bugs before often reemerge, or a fix to an, an attempted fix to a bug fails, or in, in other cases, you have this, um, you know, these features that were working for a while which fail, potentially for these same, same reasons. Okay. Um, I'll finally just say um, there's uh, a role in today's ecosystem for uh, beta tests. Um, uh, beta testing is often as much a marketing activity as it is a testing activity. It's about getting your software out there in the hands of power users and really loyal people to get a sneak peek at it, perhaps ahead of competitors or perhaps just to excite them about it and get that buzz going on social media, et cetera. It's not that it's bad, it's just you have, you have to realize it's not an effective testing strategy. It's not that we're gonna be able to outsource our testing by beta testing. You know, but we'll put it out there to the crowd and the wisdom of the crowd will identify our own bugs. If you're looking for beta testing being tested and rigorous testing, you're often gonna be disappointed. Um, there are some useful things which occur. Real world people running through real world workflows and data and environments, configurations. You get out of the lab and into the broad world. You, you actually get like um, in the 
crucible of, of real problems, you get it tested. The problem is, what? What's the problem with beta testing? Um, it is true that you get it out there, but why does it fall short often? Well, look, the people you're testing with are often not representative users. They're often power users, right? Uh, they're more tolerant of errors sometimes, um, more savvy. Um, they may not use the beta test product that heavily. Um, you can't just tell if they don't like it and they stop using it or if they don't give feedback um, uh, because, because they're happy with it. You know, um, you, you don't know, it's often ambiguous to what degree they really offer value. If you do automated crash reports, reporting from the user side, that can be very valuable. You get reports of errors that came up, but often you don't have access to them to ask about the environment exactly what's going on. And look, you don't want to scare any potential users away by bad early exposure, a flaky product. Right? Um, and people often don't report bugs, they just tire of it and they say, enough for this, this is, this is really flaky, it's more of an alpha than a beta. Right? Um, and you get lower quality bug reports. It's not to say it's not bad, it's really a, a marketing activity. It's really getting the word of mouth out there, upstaging the competition, letting partners build the top it, getting early public reviews, getting a sneak peek, hearing about customer needs that are not met, etc. Um, and particularly for power users or large installed bases, it lets them figure out how it's, gonna, how it's going to uh, be integrated. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps the most important message of this lecture, and arguably one of the most important of the class, well, I think it is one of the most important of the class, when you discover quality problems, bugs, and failures, and your, your interest in the underlying faults, fundamentally, you want to fix that problem in many cases, not all, but many. But the more fundamental issues, you want to fix your process that allowed it to come about. You want to figure out how you could have prevented it and how you could have detected it more quickly if it had come about. Um, so you should be asking, how can we test more effectively now that we found this bug? What does this tell us about how we can improve our test process? What does this tell us about how we can change how we do things in, the pro in, in our project to spread knowledge around, to lower misunderstandings between devs, to improve an understanding of the systems we're working on? So try to sharpen you know, the testing skills with respect to speed of diagnosis um, you know, in, in terms of how people zero in on bugs and, and working with, with others. Um, hypothesis check is why is this occurring? Where is the underlying fault? Okay, I went over time. I appreciate your patience. Um, please uh, do undertake this and hand it in next time. And you have yourself, will have yourself, if you do it uh, properly, you know, if you do it per, per spec, uh, put in half an hour with it, you will have yourself a perfect grade for that pop quiz. Okay? Look forward to seeing you next time. <coughs> oh, and we'll see many of you tomorrow per this per this guideline here. Right? Yes.